<laughs> okay, um, I, th I think we might as well make a start. Um, just to let you know, this seminar is being live streamed, so um, the probably uh, a large number of people, hopefully, watching this um, all over the world. I'm aware of there's quite a few people in different places watching this um, seminar, but also you'll be able to watch it on YouTube afterwards as well if you want to hopefully see it again. So very much welcome to come to the IOE this evening. My name's Doug Bourne. I'm co-director of the Development Education Research Centre here at the Institute of Education. And one of the many things our centre does is run a series of seminars looking at current themes around global education, global citizenship and global learning, development education. And this year we have taken the conscious decision to work quite closely in partnership with the lay Buddhist organisation Soka Gaiko International, and particularly their UK branch, through organising a series of events jointly, jointly with them. We organised a joint event with them at their London Centre a couple of months ago and what some of you may have been aware that two weeks ago we had a major conference just in the road at Goodenough College of which they um, had a strand within that. So one of the things that we're particularly interested in as a centre is actually promote a range of different view, world views and perspectives on global citizenship which is becoming increasingly a very popular topic. So which is one of the reasons we've uh, organised tonight's seminar looking particularly at a Buddhist perspective on global citizenship education. But the second um, reason for having this evening is to welcome back our keynote speaker, Namarata Sharma, who uh, uh, did her doctorate here um, some time ago uh, around some of the themes she'll be talking about this evening, but also worked with me as my research assistant for a number of years um, before she's now moved to the um, United States, where she's now based. So I'm very pleased that Namarata could be with us. She's been in the UK for a couple of weeks following the conference we had and we're very pleased to stay on to speak to us this evening. And so if you speak to us about 30, 40 minutes and then she'll take questions and comments. Okay, thanks. Welcome Namarata. Thanks, Nick. So, um, thank you so much everyone. I'm really excited to be here. Uh, not so good with uh, putting this on, I guess. Yeah? Okay. Okay. Thanks so much. All right. Perfect. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, everyone, for uh, being here. And, um, you know, I really appreciate uh, Kester, Doug, and Massimiliano, um, who have organized this event today, um, for the people working behind the um, scenes to live stream this, and for all of you, uh, you know, who have. Uh, taken out time to be here today in person or um, I don't know where in the world you are <laughs> listening to this. Um, and I'm really excited to be back at the Institute. I see familiar faces, uh, people that have done PhD with me in the room. Um, and then, of course, you know, coming back to Dirk, where I worked with Doug uh, for several years. Um, it's always a pleasure to be back here and I always learn so much, uh, you know, in my successive visits. Um, so. Uh, I'm going to go straight into my presentation today. Um, the topic is integrating Buddhist Soka perspectives within the UNESCO-led discourse and practice of global citizenship education. So um, the premise for this discussion is that uh, the UNESCO-led initiative of global citizenship education is gaining popularity worldwide. I think many colleagues here may be working directly with this uh, particular initiative. Uh, but as uh, many of us might know, there is a dearth of literature that really explores values-based perspectives that can bring about an intercultural dimension that really looks at the intercultural dimension of global citizenship education. So in my paper today, I would like to share some key outcomes uh, from my long-term research and publication that takes the example of Soka. Soka literally means uh, value creation for those uh, you know, who may be new to this. It means value creation in Japanese. Um, and in my work, I look at Soka both as a concept as well as a movement of lay Buddhist uh, you know, members who have endorsed several UN-led initiatives. So through a book that I had uh, published last year and other manuscripts written since, I have stressed the importance of paying attention to different philosophical understandings and values-based perspectives that can bring forth diverse and creative solutions to global issues. My argument is that by doing so, we can 
also propel people and communities to take part in local, regional, global solutions as engaged citizenry and use their values, you know, the values that inform people to take positive action in uh, their personal, social, uh, daily lives. How can we harness that uh, for the sake of education? So, for example, the Green Belt Movement in Kenya, pioneered by Wangari Maathai and inspired by African tradition, such as the mythology surrounding the sycamore fig tree, is a great uh, you know, example of, of how values inform people to take action within their local communities and create change. So, in the realm of education, one of the core challenges of fostering youth as future world citizen needs to be a focus on the values, beliefs and interests of the individual learner. So this paper today shares uh, key outcomes from my recent work and publication that engages with the education strand of UNESCO's Sustainable Development Goals. So to just give some sort of context, uh, so the United Nations 2030 Agenda seeks to eradicate extreme poverty and strengthen universal peace by integrating and balancing what uh, UNESCO calls the three dimensions of sustainable development. Um, so UNESCO highlights these as uh, the economic, social and environmental di dimensions of sustainable development. But as I have argued uh, in my study, what is missing in the existing discourse is a detailed engagement with the human personal dimension as well as a values-based framework for the UNESCO-led initiative of global citizenship education and education for sustainable development. So in relation to these arguments, uh, my long-term study of selected Asian thinkers offers suggestions for a more intercultural approach to ESD and GCE. <coughs> so I'm going to quote um, Doug here. So Dr. Bourne has uh, you know, recently published a book in 2018 and in that he um, he talks about intercultural sensitivity, uh, sensitivity uh, as a key skill that is desired by students and employers, but it needs the engagement and support of educational policy makers and bodies responsible for professional development and training. So, so my work contributes to the intercultural uh, dimension of ESD and GCE. But also a second merit of engaging with my chosen thinkers is that there are lessons that can be drawn for you know, education for global citizenship from leaders of mass movements, people who have enthused others to create positive and a positive individual and social transformation within their respective daily lives. So before I move on to my chosen thinkers, let me provide some context to these discussions within the emerging discourse on GCE. So GCE, or Global Citizenship Education, is uh, target 4.7 of UNESCO's 17 Sustainable Development Goals. Now, education has been a priority for UNESCO, both as a um, you know, Global Citizenship Education, uh, which is SDG 4.7, but also as Education for Sustainable Development, that is ESD. At the same time, several scholarship within uh, you know, scholarship and discourse on Global Citizenship and ESD uh, have started to challenge the Western dominated uh, worldview that underlie uh, global citizenship education. So there is a variety of analysis from different perspectives. Uh, you know, they have a post-colonial critique, study on the existing pedagogical assumptions within global citizenship, as well as the need to engage with alternative uh, perspectives and paradigms. So for example, uh, there are thinkers that have argued that, you know, given the border walls and um, other such realities that are creating inequalities and inequities across, you know, various nation states, of whose values and norms will guide global citizens? So, of course, there is this sort of current predicament that we are in, uh, you know, with narrow nationalism and so on. But at the same time, uh, I think global citizenship education does provide a discursive uh, space that can allow for a genuine intercultural um, understanding to take place within education where assumptions are being made um, globally, you know. Um, and so stemming from all of these uh, sort of discussions, I think one of the questions worth considering is, so where and how do we fit in less widely known perspectives into the discourse and practice of global citizenship education? The need to promote 
one of my arguments is that the need to promote comparative and contextual studies is really important today. And that is because we need to bring into focus alternative ways of thinking, acting, being, living that have informed various groups of people and have led to the development of sustainable communities worldwide. So that is really at the heart of what, you know, I have m of my inquiry as a researcher. So as mentioned earlier, I have been interested to examine Soka or value creation as a concept. Um, and today I'll be talking a little bit about the Buddhist perspectives in relation to my inquiry. But before I proceed, I, w I wanted to clarify, um, especially for our colleagues that are working in the field of Ikeda Soka studies in education, um, that, that uh, my, my conversations about Soka today are not uh, you know, limited to just the Buddhist perspectives. Um, I will be talking about Buddhism or uh, Bukyo, uh, which is the teachings of the Buddha, but uh, more in relation to Soka at a as a pedagogical approach. Um, so value creating education, moving on to the next slide, value creating education has been developed by these Japanese educators who are uh, Suni Saburo Makiguchi, Josei Toda and Daisaku Ikeda. So I'll give you just a minute to go over this slide because I know uh, this may be new information for many people. So I'll just uh, give you a minute to sort of read through it and, and get a sense of who they were. So a key term in Makiguchi's work is soka or value creation. So soka or value creation is a neology that has been uh, coined by uh, Makiguchi's fellow teacher and, su and uh, successor Toda. According to Makiguchi, the aim of human life and education should be the happiness of the individual human being and in one's ability to live contributively that is by creating meaning and value that is of benefit to both the individual self as well as to the other person. So Ikeda, who is a successor of Makiguchi and Toda, has emphasized key aspects of Makiguchi's value-creating pedagogy in his extensive lectures and educational proposals. So these three Japanese thinkers are also the leaders of the lay Buddhist organization, which is the Soka Gakkai International. The Soka Gakka International has uh, local organizations in uh, 192 countries and territories. And Ikeda is also the founder of several institutions that promote peace, culture, and education. His annual peace proposal and several initiatives uh, launched by this uh, organization, the Soka Gakka International's Office for UN Affairs, are many efforts to support various United Nations initiatives to build a peaceful and sustainable world. So in my previous comparative studies on these three uh, thinkers, the Soka progenitors, as well as the Indian political leader Mahatma Gandhi, I found that there are several commonalities in their views on education and religion, their intercultural experiences, as well as their ability to enthuse large numbers of people to work for social justice. The key common focus for Mahatma Gandhi, as well as for the three Japanese thinkers, the key common focus for them has been the human being and human development. Their respective religious beliefs were rooted in non-dualistic philosophies that perceive an inextricable link between the lives of oneself and others. So for Makiguchi Toda in Ikeda, it was the practice of Buddhism. So uh, Ikeda explicitly draws a link between the Buddhist view of interdependence and his proposals on education for global citizenship. In a lecture titled uh, Thoughts on Education for Global Citizenship, delivered at the Teachers College, Columbia University in 1996, he uses a metaphor that alludes to this Buddhist concept of dependent origination, which, as he explains elsewhere, and I'm going to quote Ikeda here, is that all beings and phenomena exist or occur in relation to other beings or phenomena. Everything is linked to an intricate web of causation and connection, and nothing, whether in the realm of human affairs or of natural phenomena, can exist or occur solely of its own accord. So this is a quotation from Ikeda. 
So the goal of education within the Soka paradigm, which is individual happiness, is inextricably linked to other people. That is, an individual cannot truly become happy on one's own. Instead, happiness is found in a life of value creation, which as Ikeda describes again, to quote him, is, it is the capacity to find meaning, to enhance one's own existence and contribute to the well-being of others under any circumstances. This inseparable link between the happiness of the self and the welfare of the other, it's not just theoretical. Um, so I did observation of um, observational studies of soccer schools uh, in Japan uh, for several years, uh, more than a decade, uh, you know, across uh, my sort of masters in Japan and my, my PhD at the Institute here. And what I found in, and what many scholars have also uh, written about is that this understanding of this, this uh, inseparable link between uh, the happiness of the self and the welfare of the other, it permeates the ethos within these Soka education institutions. These institutions are secular schools and universities established by Ikeda. So these discussions, and that's one of the reasons I did a PhD here, was that, you know, these discussions need to also have uh, some sort of bearing on mainstream education. Um, and so that, that really is, uh, you know, the bulk of my recent uh, book titled Value Creating Global Citizenship Education is how do we bring uh, the discussions from thinkers who are sort of marginalized, who are on the sidelines, Gandhi, Maki, Gucci, Ikeda, how do we bring them into the main, into mainstream discourse on global citizenship education and education for sustainable development? So one of my arguments is that while maintaining its focus on and giving agency to the individual human being, global citizenship education must not get trapped in promoting individualism, which has also been pointed out in recent scholarly work as the hallmark of education informed by a neoliberal paradigm. In this context, a value-creating paradigm can have a substantive role in nurturing individual who can, individuals who can lead contributive lives through education for global citizenship. So as discussed previously in my comparative study on these selective thinkers, again, it's not just that their notion of interdependency was just theoretical. It was deeply embedded. And I use Gandhi as an example because, you know, unfortunately, he is better known than my uh, three chosen Japanese thinkers. So it, it, it provides a good segue to understand uh, very quickly both Soka as a concept and as, as well as a movement, uh, you know, by, by the way of, uh, of the example of Gandhi. So um, for Gandhi as well as for these thinkers, their notion of interdependency was embedded in their political and educational activism. However, and I think importantly, they were not just activists, but they were thinkers who used their creative imagination to build an intimate connection between the autonomous, morally self-sustained and self-governed citizen and a fully-fledged, self-reflecting and self-correcting socio-political and educational community. I know that's quite a you know, sort of dense sentence, a lot packed in that. Uh, but basically to say that they use the notion of interdependency to enthuse large numbers of people to work for social justice and create movements that have had ripple effects um, you know, in, in different countries and, and continents. As we know in the case of Gandhi, uh, not so much is known about these three thinkers. But hopefully some, you know, this, this presentation will um, add to the discourse on, on Ikeda studies in education. So um, a shift in paradigm and perspectives, it is argued here, will have a significant bearing on praxis and the three domains of learning within the global citizenship education conceptual dimensions of UNESCO, the cognitive, social, emotional, and behavioral. And I'm going to again repeat that because I know um, it's a lot packed into that one sentence. Um, but you know, it is pretty simple. It is really the fact that if you have a shift in your perspective, for sure, education will look very different in, in, its, in its praxis and practice. As well as uh, the, pra the, the cognitive dimension, the social emotional and behavioral dimension of education will start to look very different, uh, depending on what perspective uh, we have or we bring into uh, you know, the classrooms, for example. So the task of sustainable development can be enhanced through integra integrating intercultural perspectives that can draw from diverse wisdom and understandings that is in line with UNESCO's educational aims. So for example, my study of these uh, Asian thinkers suggests that the cognitive dimension of global citizenship education 
can expand its current focus from individual empowerment, as suggested by UNESCO, to a contributive life. I think we've we just taken it for granted um, that in individual empowerment is the way to be, is the way to uh, work for social justice. Well, that's not true. There are so many other ways to work for social justice. Individual empowerment is just one. Uh, leading a contributive life, a collective bold action is also another way. Uh, you know, and we don't hear much uh, about that in the discourse uh, by UNESCO or UNESCO-led discourse on global citizenship education. So moving on to the socio-emotional dimension, attempts are made in my work to view our interdependence and common humanity through these selected Asian perspectives and to offer suggestions that can enhance dialogic, reflective and transformative learning experiences. So as an example, it is argued here that a greater attention needs to be given to education that enables students to take action based on understanding the other. So it's great to have uh, you know, charity and advocacy. But how about developing one's own values and perspectives through the process of dialogue? And in viewing the behavioral dimension of, uh, of global citizenship education, my work undertakes a critical analysis. Well, what does it mean to be an active citizen? And what about the political impl implications of taking action based on values such as peace and nonviolence? You know, if you really study Gandhi deeply, um, and unfortunately Gandhi is uh, studied so superficially, we uh, even in India we um, study Gandhi the moral leader. We do not study Gandhi the radical leader or the or the or the creative leader, right? Uh, but there are these. Um, strategies, behaviors, and beliefs as citizens uh, that these uh, thinkers demonstrate, have demonstrated, that, that students can, and, and teachers, all of us can learn from. So there's a scholar, Tark, um, who makes an important uh, argument. And um, he, plays, he says that you know, we place a great emphasis in, uh, on, on active citizen, on, on fostering active citizens within global citizenship education. Um, and I quote him here, uh, and I really like this sentence. He says that, particularly in the Anglo-West, the global citizen aligns quite seamlessly with a middle-class neoliberal subjectivity in the form of a highly individuated, empowered citizen who chooses to, using personal and private resources, chip in and make a difference. You know, I mean, I, before I started my PhD, uh, this is how I was, you know, growing up as, as a middle-class um, young woman in India. I thought I'd come to the institute and I'll chip in and make a difference. <laughs> but uh, but uh, Tark was uh, great. I mean, reading Tark was, and I, I encourage you to read him, um, was really great uh, and an eye opener. Uh, so, so one of the suggestions uh, Tark makes is that instead um, to foster active global citizens in the 21st century, there should be, a, a, you know, sort of the um, a critical approach uh, to learning about global citizenship within the classroom. And once students are able to sort of, you know, engage with global citizenship through these critical lenses, they themselves will be able to identify and take action based on their own volition on issues that are relevant to their local schools and communities, which makes, uh, you know, complete sense now to me. So in this regard, uh, so my proposal is that, you know, let's include, uh, you know, a study of the lives of these thinkers, thinkers such as these, who, are, who were involved in their own politics to uh, allow uh, readers to acquire critical understandings in the field of politics and the complexities of political processes in contemporary societies. This is really important because we see, you know, youth are just so amazing. I love being, uh, you know, I love being enthused by youth and they continue to motivate me. And I, and I feel at the same time that um, these are the political actors that also can benefit from a study of these <coughs> other thinkers that have not just been activists, but have also you know, learned from their uh, mm, being embroiled in their socio-political educational scenarios. Um, so second, and related to this proposal uh, you know, of, of citizens learning from these examples, is the sense of urgency with which teachers need to be enabled to engage with what? And I, I'd quote uh, Hess and McAvoy here. Um, their 2014 work um, talks about the political classroom. Um, and, you know, they, 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 this is H-E-S-S, Hess and McAvoy, M-C-A-V-O-Y. I'm going to um, you know, really recommend people who work with kids in the classroom. I don't. I, I work with uh, youth in higher ed. But um, they've written an amazing book uh, called The Political Classroom. And it's about preparing kids to understand and navigate through politics that affect their daily lives. So through these discussions, um, coming back to my work, the, dispos the disposition and agenda of global citizenship education 
that these theoretical chapters in my recent book promote are criticality for social justice and value creation for social self-actualization. So the second part of this book engages with practical lessons that em emerge from the preceding theoretical chapters. So I developed these themes and approaches um, you know, in the second part of my book and I must say that um, so Doug's 2014 uh, work, and uh, that's on the DERC website, it's, uh, it, it really, and, and I quote that in my book as well, it really gave me so many thoughts, uh, you know, uh, to, to write my work, uh, my book, and, uh, and I encourage you to read that. It's a 2014 publication. Um, and in that, you know, uh, he also talks about themes and approaches uh, for, for learning. And so I, I, so I borrowed the framework from that work. Um, so in, in this work, in my work, um, I offer a global content, uh, you know, offering perspectives from a study of non-Western thinkers that can be infused or incorporated within formal, non-formal and informal education set settings. These pedagogical approaches, uh, you know, are, are not to be treated as a separate subject. Uh, that's the last thing teachers need is <laughs> a separate subject, you know, in the curriculum. It really is an integral part. It's to be treated as an integral part of, of an existing subject. For example, in schools within civics or citizenship education, social studies, uh, environmental studies, health education, and across disciplines in higher education that promote uh, programs that promote sustainability issues and social responsibility. So I won't go very much, of course, into the details of that. Uh, just to say that this proposed framework for the practice of value creating global citizenship education is developed in response to sustainable uh, to some of the sustainable development goals, uh, including climate change. Um, and each of the themes, again, you know, uh, as in my sort of presentation today, really challenges epistemic assumptions and offers suggestions for practice based on alternative practice uh, perspectives. So all of this was a discussion largely about uh, Soka as a concept and the contribution uh, that a discourse on Soka as a concept can make to global citizenship education and education for sustainable development. But also, uh, like I had mentioned earlier, a study of Soka as a movement can help, lessons, uh, help develop lessons for citizenship education in asking what happens when values engage in real world politics in education. A study of the lives and movements of people who were embroiled in their own socio-political educational context can help learners to develop skills of criti criticality, creativity, and propel a collective response to create a more global and sustainable world. So further studies, of course, are required on the topic of value creating global citizenship education. Um, I think two um, ways in which the studies can be carried forward are first, um, as an educational resource. Uh, value creating global citizenship education can contribute to the discourse by offering uh, lessons from a study of alternative paradigms and perspectives. You know, of how uh, we can think about how differently we all think about ourselves, society, nature and discourse uh, and, and uh, universe. So how we think about ourselves, society, nature and universe and how that can sort of contribute to the discourse and the intercultural dimension of global citizenship education. But also, um, the second way in which studies can be carried forward is, you know, what lessons can be uh, learned from a study of this movement. And, and again, you know, when I'm uh, referring to Soka as a movement, a, I'm not just alluding to the movement by the lay Buddhist organization, the Soka Gaka International, um, which is a sort of faith-based, uh, you know, which is carrying out uh, faith-based activities at grassroots level. But uh, my reference is also to Ikeda's contributions uh, through his development of various institutions as well as his many dialogues with both Western and non-Western perspectives that promote peace, culture and education with the aim to foster capable and contributive uh, citizens. So this is my um, final slide and uh, so my, you know, so my work, uh, the, the book itself and, and my sort of ongoing work makes recommendations for the United Nations 2030 Agenda for Global Citizenship Education. Um, so that, as I had mentioned earlier, uh, this 2030 Agenda is, um, you know, it, it seeks to eradicate extreme poverty and strengthen universal peace by integrating the economic, social and environmental dimension. And my argument is, well, um, you know, what about the uh, engagement with the human personal dimension? And then another recommendation is, as I had mentioned uh, through this uh, talk, is uh, to offer value creating global citizenship education as a pedagogical approach. Uh, 
So UNESCO currently offers three pedagogical approaches, uh, which are a learner-centered approach, an action-oriented approach, and a transformative uh, learning approach. And my argument is that a value-creating approach can place emphasis on building relationships. Here at, again, quote Ikeda, who says that we need to, to advocate an ethic of coexistence, a spirit that seeks to encourage mutual flourishing and mutually supportive relationships between humans and between humans and nature. And so building relationships through education for sustainable development between the individual learner and her uh, or his natural and social environment by engaging with the personal dimension is another uh, contribution uh, that I make through my work. And uh, finally, there are lessons from movements, um, not just Soka, but by the Earth Charter. Some of you may know about these movements, some might not, but it's really worth looking at them. Movements inspired by the Earth Charter Green Belt movement um, that I had just uh, cited earlier in the beginning of my presentation. The Chipko movement, um, Eco Justice, Gandhi, Ikeda, and other such uh, movements that have helped to ex that can help to expand the current focus in global citizenship education and education for sustainable development from individual empowerment to enable bold uh, collective efforts. So I'd like to just conclude with this sentence and, um, and it is that you know, the dominance of English as the lingua franca in promoting and developing global citizenship education makes it particularly important that curricular themes and practices can allow learning from other views that are developed within non-English and or non-Western contexts. Thank you so much and for your patience. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Next time I'm going to wear a pocket, a dress with a pocket. <laughs> Thanks, Namarata, that was great. Um, I'm sure people have got a lot of um, questions I thought they might want to, to post to you, but I, I just wanted to sort of start the conversation right? and by asking you possibly to give a sort of an indication of an example of what is particular, what, uh, what's the added value of sort of a value-based perspective and in terms of if people are looking for examples of practice, whether it's within formal education or higher education, that very much reflects where you're coming from and what your thinking is. What, what, what does that look like? And if you, just to say a little bit about an example or two, might help us to sort of frame some of these conversations. Yeah? Thanks so much, Doug. That's, uh, as always, Doug has uh, thought-provoking questions, and I don't think I can answer, uh, you know, I can, I can respond to it adequately today, but it will, um, you know, uh, be something I continue to think about. I know, you know, Doug makes a big contribution to this discourse uh, by highlighting the kind of skills that we need. You know, so there is uh, this there is a lack of uh, uh, material or, or uh, resources that contributes to the skill based, you know, uh, need for for skills uh, within the discourse of global citizenship education. The the reason I uh, you know think that values based um, perspectives as well can contribute to the discourse is that it engages with the human personal dimension. It also allows for us to move uh, beyond the hegemony, you know, in a sense, uh, that there exists. So for example, when we look at compassion, uh, you know, as a key value, we were, uh, you know, colleagues and I were talking about this recently, we look at values of empathy being emphasized by um, UNESCO and, and several scholars that have written uh, on global citizenship education, which is a UNESCO-led initiative, compassion as a value is lacking. Um, and one of the reasons for that might be that there is a lack of integration of different types of values that come from less widely known perspectives. And this has, you know, relevance for praxis as well. Uh, again, going back to the Soka schools that I did, uh, you know, observational studies, uh, that I went to do observational studies for several years. Um, the Soka schools highlight friendship as being a very important um, key aspect of the way that education, uh, you know, is, is done. The business of education carries out in the schools. Now, friendship, along with empathy, is the definition of compassion in Sanskrit. So, so the word Sanskrit, the, the word for compassion in Sanskrit is both empathy and friendship. 
So when you look at the soccer schools that are inspired by Ikeda's ideas, and of course, you know, compassion is a, is a key value that Ikeda highlights, you see why compassion, friendship, as well as empathy are uh, focused on within the way in which soccer schools you know, conduct their daily business in the, in the school ethos. So we tend to miss what is happening at grassroots level in schools as well as within movements because we are not engaging with human, the human personal dimension, but also because there is this hegemony that we cannot see beyond Western perspectives. So there's like sort of a different reasons for sort of you know, bringing values-based perspectives into the discourse on global citizenship education. I don't know if that sort of answers the question. Okay, other questions? Uh, that's a school that I know over the past 10 years has been applying these principles, exactly these principles uh, of courage, compassion, and global citizenship. And the head teacher is currently in a dilemma whereby they have, because she's been teaching uh, LBGT uh, um, mm -hmm. relationships as part of the national curriculum, mm -hmm. and she is now finding herself under receipt of death threats mm -hmm. and uh, gatherings of people who are not from the school. Mm -hmm objecting to what she was doing. The children uh, today, in fact, posted a letter on Twitter to where it's saying, we are a school which values each other. Um, and the, all the other schools in the area, the other four schools in the area, have stopped teaching this. Mm -hmm. She, the head teacher, is absolutely committed to this whole idea of, as you say, uh, an ethos of, of coexistence. Um, without wanting to put you on the spot. Mm -hmm. What advice would you give her? Should she just do what the other schools have done and let and respect the non-Western belief systems of some of the community, or to advocate a global citizenship of courage, compassion, and wisdom? I mean, yeah, it is a hard question to you know respond to. Um, it's a hard it's, as well as I, I don't think I would. Um, give advice to someone else uh, as to what they need to or should do. But I, I can just say that I think somewhere along the line, uh, we have all, I guess, you know, gathered here, including myself, made a conscious decision to go beyond our comfort zone. You know, um, we are not happy with the th way things have been, you know, for us. And that's why we are in this room, I guess, today, or, or you know, people watching live stream, if anybody is. Um, and so I cannot, you know, I cannot say that, that uh, just be sort of, you know, just be sort of sitting in your own sort of living room and not take action. I cannot say that, you know, because that's not the person I am. I have pushed myself beyond my comfort zone as not as much as Gandhi for sure. Um, but you know, that that would be my suggestion, that, uh, that there are various people that are looking at us for being inspired as we are looking at them to be inspired and we need a bold collective action you know individual empowerment is is not just going to be enough to move forward and so what kind of support uh, can we give to her I guess you know would be the question I ask myself rather than you know um, telling her what she needs to do Fascinating, um, and as you know, I'm interested in this area as well. So mm -hmm. currently, the, my problem is, yes, I talk about these things, not especially because I come from a Theravada Buddhist uh, background, uh, similar and slightly different. Whenever I try to integrate uh, this into my pedagogical approaches and talk about it at conferences, very recently, when I talk about happiness should be uh, an aim of um, education, uh, somebody laughed, somebody mm -hmm. who is very significant laughed. <laughs> and I'm not surprised. Uh, so um, I know uh, Prof. De Bourne uh, always, uh, he made a huge uh, contribution to non-Western kind of um, understanding about global citizenship and education and higher education. But I, I haven't, I think, met anyone else uh, within, you know, <laughs> uh, um, um, academia who is kind of encouraging, who is happy to um, uh, 
introduce these kind of non-resistant values, and it's it's a big challenge. Um, I know we don't have um, um, answers, but it it is a big challenge. You, we can write about it. Uh, if we write articles about it, they are straight away rejected. Uh, so there, there are very huge political aspects to this. Absolutely, I I completely agree. Uh, I completely agree. So. We did a PhD at the same time, uh, Tushari and myself, at the institute here. Um, and um, it was really a challenge even to um, you know, engage with these thinkers um, in a way that people could understand. I had to use scaffolding learning, literally, you know, to sort of explain. So no, no, dharma means it isn't exactly the same as. Um, and. Uh, but at the same time, you know, I had people like Doug, uh, Professor Jack Dees Gundara, Bob Ferguson, who were my uh, PhD supervisors, who were interested to listen to alternative perspectives. And I think that's where you know we are. I mean, Sukheda has a has a dial has had a dialogue with um, Arnold Toynbee, you know, the British historian. And in that uh, dialogue uh, called Choose Life, Ty Toynbee talks about the deeper, slower movement that really make that substantive, substantial change in the long run. And I think in some ways we are, you know, pioneers. If you really look at India, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a young nation, you know, it's um, recent political elections and everything that we've gone through, um, you know, it's still a young nation. Um, 50 years ago, Gandhi would not be able to do a PhD here, right? So, but we are able, I am able to, I was able to, you know, graduate from here in 2006. Uh, doing a PhD on Gandhi. So in, in many ways, we are sort of uh, drawing on their legacy on, on, and you know, reaping their, uh, the benefits of what uh, seeds they planted. And I do feel that, uh, and I uh, talk about youth again, you know, I see some youth at the back of this room who, ha who are creating uh, a lot of um, change within their local communities and how best can we support the youth. I think that's where our focus needs to be, not on the politics. I have a lot more referencing and material that I can work with because of the efforts you guys made, so thank you. Um, it makes my life a little bit easier. Um, the question I have is around kind of soccer educators and actually humanistic educators in general. So, um, you know, we have these really unique movements that have created transformation in society. And the School of Value is another example of this head teacher really being a leader in, in creating this change. But, um, very often, that's that's a that's a unique that's usually a unique ex um, situation. It's it's not the normal, right? If it was, I think we would we need to have this discussion. So, um, what do you think it takes, and how can that be then put into training to allow teachers and policymakers who are interested in education in, in general who can actually have the social emotional intelligence, the the I internal skills they need to be able to transmit this to young people through policy or actual teaching? That's a great question. That's a great question. And I think one of the, that was one of the questions that uh, Toda had, right? The, the, the second of the three Japanese thinkers who I had uh, spoken about today. That's one of the questions he had. Uh, so after World War II, he was, uh, you know, he and Maki Gucci were both teachers and Maki Gucci uh, was incarcerated. He, he died in prison. Toda comes out and he has the same question as you, right, Sonia? And um, so he thinks of, well, what can I do? You know, he sort of has this sense of powerlessness in a sense. Uh, you know, how can, how can I, as a, just an individual, create this, this massive vision that Maki Gucci has left me with? And so one of the things that he does is this movement that Maki Gucci and he had initiated was a lay Buddhist uh, educators organization. And so he then takes it and opens it to the wider society. So now in s he, he uh, re-established what was Soka Kyoiku Gakkai, or Value Creating Education Society, as Value Creating Education, Value Creating Society, for not just educators, but for people from all walks of life. And the reason for that, and the reason uh, you know, I, I bring that up, is that movements are also equally important. Movements create that space you know, n um, networks, but, uh, but not networks in the superficial way where we are kind of, again, you know, empowering ourselves as individuals, but, but movements in the sense, and, and I'm aware that movements like Richard Rorty says, you know, also can be dangerous to the partitions and all of that, but, but movements have a, a, a way in which to create the society 
again, you know, quoting um, Ikeda, who quotes uh, another thinker, and I've forgotten uh, who Ikeda quotes, but this, we need the society that supports the education that can then, you know, create this type of, um, you know, this type of a social, emotional, cognitive, and behavioral dimension within learning. Um, so how can we understand what those movements are? How can we bring about a collaboration between these types of movements? And I'm just talking with Doug, um, you know, before coming into the seminar and saying, we need to bring maybe, even if it is just a book, that talks about these different movements that are doing very similar things, but in their own different, you know, spaces. Based on their based on their teachings and this kind of society 5.0 uh, kind of initiative they have in Japan, I don't know if you're familiar with that, but oh, the Soka? Yeah, so do they does Soka have a what, what are some of the movements happening right now? Yes, um, it is. It is. Um, it is. Uh, so, I guess. It is in 192 countries and territories, and in, in its own, sort of th that's the beauty about the way that the Soka movement has adapted to the particularities. So the Soka movement in UK is also pretty active, but again, looks very different, uh, does its activities very different according to the particularities of what, are, what is the need and the context of the people here. Um, in Japan, it, because it has been there for a while, uh, so there are, you know, peace, uh, there, there are uh, sort of organizations that Ikeda has established uh, that promote peace, culture, and education. Uh, in, in the UK right now, uh, there's just the grassroots, uh, you know, Soka Gaka International Movement. Um, I, I'm also interested in the sense about um, the particular current context. Um, political and social context within which we're currently living and, and it partly relates to that comment over there and, that, and I'm, I'm just interested in the extent to which SGI and from your own experiences and where, <coughs> where you're now living um, the extent to which some of these the, some of the philosophy of what you're raising where it comes into clash with lots of the dominant political thinking and actually how people are working through that. Because I think one of the issues is that they can all be, you know, we can all say this is great, but actually it remains on the margins and says a group of inward people just end up just talking to themselves. And I've raised your point about movements. So I'm just interested to know, you know, if you're aware of where some of that interface happens and Obviously, if I, you now live in the United States, you're probably in the worst possible place for some of that. <laughs> it's too but, um, <laughs> but I'm just wondering, you say, how how people are how are people engaging with that context? Um, because I know that when we had the other uh, seminar here a few weeks ago, that's one of the things we particularly picked up upon was this sense about the social and political relevance of the things you're raising. That actually, how do we equip people? to engage with those debates mm -hmm. and not feel marginalized and isolated. And I just wonder if you've got how that how you find that in your own experience. So that's that's a great question. I, I think um so the way that uh, the grassroots organization of and, and I can just sort of um you know maybe as a researcher is, is how best I, I could I can respond to this question is that um uh, there is a lot to be learned from Ikeda's being Im embroiled in his own socio-political educational scenario. I think Soka Gaka International as a movement right now is still pretty new. Um, and uh, maybe in a more safe space, uh, you know, so it ha grassroots activities are being conducted, peace culture and educational activities are being conducted in a safe space, uh, in dialogue with the particularities with people in across different countries, you know, in their own sort of own neighborhoods. But uh, when Ikeda started to have this conversation, you know, this type of uh, an, um, initiative, he got into a great deal of trouble. And we don't study that uh, much about that, even within the Soka Gaka International. We, again, you know, like we study the moral Gandhi, we study the moral Ikeda. And, and I think as a researcher, I would say that there is a lot to learn from Ikeda's diplomacy and how much, uh, you know, trouble he had to get into. Um, as a citizen, when he went off to China, the Soviet Union at that time, you know, as, as just a, as an individual citizen and trying to promote dipl uh, citizens' diplomacy, you know, I, I quote him here. Um, 
And so, and so you know, it is pretty easy for the Soka Kaka International right now, I think, to do its its uh, sort of grassroots activities. But as it will start to take bold actions, uh, like the three pre Soka progenitors, it will start to get into a little tricky situation, which is not the case today. And there is a great deal of learning from thinkers uh, who have been embroiled in their own you know, scenarios. Absolutely, I'm, I, I, I'm part of the soccer movement, so soccer square Kai for over 30 years. I come from Italy, I started to practice there, and now I'm in the UK. But one thing that I, I don't know if it's relevant, but you know, one thing that fascinated me is the way exactly the diplomacy in which Ikeda and then each one of us can actually contribute in ways that perhaps are not um, so. So really are creative ways. For example, when he had, um, he was opposed a lot for his ideas, he started intercultural uh, exchanging between China and Japanese students. Mm. So that was quite a very simple uh, policy that he applied in his schools. But the result now, how many years later, is the fact that perhaps the decision makers in China and Japan are actually friends. Therefore, the tension mm -hmm. between China and Jampa Japan, which is quite historical, is actually diminished. Don't say I don't know exactly. Mm -hmm. Completely vanished. But, but the fact that this this relationship, these people are friends, mm -hmm. like you mentioned, friendship before. Mm -hmm. So that is um, I don't know if yeah, it's, it's a concrete example how we can, in ways, apply our own creativity. And as an ordinary citizen, for myself, you know, I have, a ch I have children, mm. and um, I found myself, the reason I'm here actually is because of my son, 24 years old, who's not a member, but he was interested in value creation. And um, so I was, because I wanted to be able to explain a little bit more, I came to this lecture today. But one thing that he's doing, is uh, is being very involved and still is with the Stinchel Rebellion, you know, and that is another action that um, you know is 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 a, is a, is, a, is an action that is needed now and is actually creating a big impact at the right moment. Um, it could have gone other ways, you know, instead they decided to use uh, political, uh, do you say political disobedience? What is it, you know? Yeah. And this, I think, is having an impact. So I don't know if they make no, examples no, 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 no. how sure. what we're doing is actually having an impact. Mm -hmm. Thank okay. you. Let's take, let's take a more comment before you respond, then, Rata. OK? Yeah. Um, I just wanted to ask if you could maybe also um, talk about, again, this particular approach to dialogue, about even when it comes to working uh, talking to people who <coughs> have diametrically op opposing ideals, um, finding that common ground and building that kind of approach and how maybe that particular uh, approach to dialogue also has a quite an interesting um, contributive effect to create, you know, really mainstreaming these ideas. Can that, I that's a that really interesting. Can I answer that for your, yes. Yes. as an answer? Well, yes. I know the teacher in, in uh, Anderson Park has read Takeda's post for peace and he comes up, and you know, I know she bases this on her curriculum because I've, I've worked with her for about 10 years. And the three things that Akeda says, if you want to do global citizenship, first, you've got to do your own inner revolution, mm -hmm. transformation. Mm -hmm. Second, you've got to learn how to dialogue with people who don't look and think like you. And only then should you aspire to global citizenship. Because if you're applying, supposed to do global citizenship, you're not willing to do your human evolution. Mm -hmm. equal, not revolution, that's the specific thing to the Sokagaka. Mm -hmm. And dialoguing the skills cannot ever achieve global citizenship. And I know that the children in Anderson Park have that dialoguing personal development on a daily basis through their activities, dialoguing skills. And so to see a, a year six boy is, uh, from his land write a letter which is incredibly articulate saying, we do not do this in our school, is incredibly inspiring mm -hmm. for the adults who are not as involved as that year six child. Any more comments for us and we're also to try to respond. Does anyone else wants to have anything that I've spoken so far? Great, okay. I mean I you know, don't have very much to say. I know I spoke the whole evening, so 
Um, you know, I really, again, want to thank everybody, um, you know, who, have, who has uh, sort of come here, taken out your time to be here. Um, and I do encourage you to um, use social network, social media. You know, the, the, um, the, the Dirk has a, an amazing platform. Uh, last week, and, and that's the other thing I wanted to uh, sort of use this platform to say, was that two, two weeks ago there was this um, conference, uh, Angel Conference, um, uh, hosted again, uh, you know, by Dirk and, and uh, Jean. Please find out more about that. You'll get to know, you know, more about not just you know what I have uh, you know talked about, but various different types of creative, diverse uh, perspectives that are contributing to the broad uh, discussions on global citizenship education worldwide. So that's all. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Raman Arat. <coughs> Can I just say? Thanks very much, Namaran. That was great. I, I, I think what's quite important in terms of the conversations we've just had is that, um, and which is something we always try and do in the seminars that we organise, is that to move beyond discussions uh, around issues that go beyond these four walls of, of this institution and to see the social, political and cultural relevance of, uh, of, of the debates we're having. And there are a number of things in what Namarat has spoken about, about value-based uh, approach to global citizenship education, the points just been raised about dialogue and compassion and empathy, and the sense in which there are things that we feel should be part of everyone's everyday lives, and as we know, are not always there. So I think that's also important, but also I think if you are um, in the world of education, there's a sense in which, as an educator, you have a role and responsibility. How do we take these things forward? And they're not always easy. And some of that conversation this evening, I think, is reflected on some of those challenges. But I think behind all that is the sense of which having some sense of personal philosophy and personal outlook on the world, where you want to make the world a better place to be so important. So I think that, to me, and I find that's what I've got from what Namarat has said this evening, uh, is the sense in which to, to think about those things and actually how they relate to what we are as individuals and what we do. So thanks again, Namarata, for your wonderful presentation this evening, and thanks everyone for coming. I look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you.